Welcome to Context. This is Brad Harris. In my last episode, I discussed the book The Square and the Tower, Networks and Power, From the Freemasons to Facebook, by Neil Ferguson. As I mentioned, Neil is among the most famous historians of our generation, with much of his professional effort extending well beyond academia to ensure that policymakers and the public better understand how to apply the lessons of history to current issues. I was fortunate enough to connect with Neil recently and further discuss his perspective on some of those issues. Neil and I talk about his unique career blending academic and popular history. We address the changing politics of academia and the growing challenge of interpreting the past productively. And we discuss how the fundamental institutions responsible for the prosperity of modern civilization are being increasingly downplayed in higher education in favor of identity history. In particular, I ask Neil about one of his most important books, titled Civilization, the West and the Rest, in which he defines the institutions of modern prosperity that originated in Western Europe. And it might be helpful for me to briefly review them here in case you haven't read the book. He dubs these institutions Western Civilization's killer apps because they are the key ideas that catalyzed modernity. And like apps, they're all open source. Anyone can download them to run a more prosperous, free, and innovative socioeconomic operating system, as it were. And for countries that have done this, such as China, catching up with the development of the world's most advanced countries has become a very real prospect. These are the killer apps he lays out. Competition, which Neil describes as the decentralization of political and economic life. Science, where he focuses specifically on modern scientific methods of understanding and controlling the natural world. The rule of law, which he frames as the protection of private property and enforcement of contracts that forms the basis for representative government. Modern medicine, pretty self-explanatory. The consumer society, which Neil explains is crucial for the establishment of industrialization and the modern economy, which support unprecedented standards of living. And finally, the work ethic, which Neil interprets as a distinctive moral framework that motivates and sustains all of the other institutions we care about. As you'll hear me remark, it's tragic that more and more college students, even history majors, can successfully graduate without studying any one of these fundamental institutions. And Neil elaborates on how this educational blind spot imposes huge political and economic liabilities. I really appreciated Neil's sober insight and how gracious he was with his time, and I hope you enjoy our chat as much as I did. Neil Ferguson, thank you so much for joining me on Context. It's a real privilege having you here. My pleasure, Brad. Now, given how involved you are in so many different important projects, um, to start things off, maybe you could just summarize your sense of your own professional identity and the role that you see yourself playing in society. I'm not sure I, I've ever thought about my professional identity. I'm, I'm a historian, but I'm a, I'm a historian who is interested in contemporary problems. I might even call myself an applied historian. I started my career as a, an economic historian, in particular a financial historian, but I've never believed that history works well in silos uh, and sub-specialisms. So my approach has tended to be to integrate the economic and the political and indeed the social and cultural. I've also believed in in writing in different genres. I've written some rather intimidating scholarly books. I'm in the midst of a biography of Henry Kissinger, which will have Teutonic numbers of footnotes. But I've also written popular histories, presented television histories, and tried my best to get history to the widest possible audience and not just to students in elite colleges. So I've tried to democratize the work that I do and of course, I'm very unusual for leaning uh, rightwards rather than leftwards politically. That's that's almost become uh, an extinct combination uh, in the academy. You brought up a term um, I'm interested in, applied history. Can you say a little bit more about what you mean by that? Sure. The idea is that you can't understand 
any contemporary problem, whether it's a problem of financial regulation or geopolitics, or for that matter, a domestic social policy without some historical perspective. I mean, you can try. Uh, you can try to reduce the problem to some kind of economic model, but by and large, you won't get very far. And historical perspective ought to be mandatory for people contemplating any strategic decision, whether in the public or the private sector. It's odd that historians over the last 20 or 30 years have more or less withdrawn from involvement in policy formulation, strategic thinking, and increasingly occupy a a detached academic world in which either you study the past as an antiquarian because it's just so interesting, or you study the past using anachronistic subjective categories. That's the the kind of history which goes back to the 18th century and says how terrible these people were. They they condoned slavery. With applied history, we're concerned to, to learn from the past rather than condescend to it and to try to understand by looking at past experience a contemporary problem. And that, that's the way in which I've tended to work throughout my career. And it's why I have never hesitated to go from writing works of history to commenting on contemporary problems. I genuinely believe that having some historical understanding of a problem helps you think about it. And that's what applied history is all about, using past knowledge to understand contemporary problems better. One of the uh, parts of your career I find most interesting is that you've done work uh, advising heads of state on both sides of the Atlantic. Is that right? Uh, I have spent time with prime ministers and I have spent time with with ministers, cabinet ministers in the UK. And I've also uh, spent time with presidential candidates, more than presidents, uh, in the US and enjoyed the interactions that I have with senators and and members of the House of Representatives. I think that historians have something to offer to policymakers. One of the obvious insights that one can draw from writing the life of Henry Kissinger is that his ability to think about the strategic problems facing the Nixon and Ford administrations rested heavily on historical understanding. You can uh, criticize specific policy decisions and Plenty of people have done that. But what you can't deny is that there was a remarkably sophisticated strategic framework in the Nixon and Ford administrations, and it owed a good deal to Kissinger's historical understanding. My contributions have been trivial by by comparison with his, and I've spent far more time in the academy than in the corridors of power. But uh, I think there is a lot to be said for bringing historical perspective into high-level decision-making. It's it's my observation that in the United States, it plays too little a role, and that leads to some horrendous mistakes. The the obvious example is the way in which the the 9-11 attacks led to a very big strategic error, which was the invasion of Iraq. Very little historical thinking was done in 2002-2003 about what the consequences of invading Iraq might be. And it seems remarkable, looking back on it, that almost nobody was asking the right questions about about Iraq as as a country with a history, uh, which included, of course, a, a British occupation, an insurgency against that occupation in 1920. None of that was in the discussion in Washington and on the eve of the Iraq invasion. One could go on. The financial crisis is a terrific example. In in 2008, the decision makers were, with perhaps a handful of exceptions, strangely oblivious of the risk of of another Great Depression. And I came to realize very few people in the financial world in 2008 had any real knowledge of the the 1929 financial crisis. Most people in financial markets and in regulatory agencies were operating with only the history that they knew from their own experience. Financial history is actually a a much neglected field of study. There's hardly any financial history taught 
at American universities. And it was just luck that the chairman of the Federal Reserve in 2008, Ben Bernanke, had, had studied the Great Depression early in his academic career, uh, because that knowledge proved vital in realizing just how big the mess was after Lehman Brothers went bust. So I think there, there are lots of examples I could could give you. But I think if you think of the two big crises of recent years, 9-11 and its aftermath, and then the financial crisis in 2008 and its aftermath, it's striking how ill-informed key decision makers were about the historical context of the crisis that they were confronting. Hmm. Well, and we'll get to another um, social crisis that may be unfolding now that you touch on in the square and the tower with some historical lessons in the printing press uh, back 500 years ago in just a minute. I wanted to go back to something you brought up earlier, anachronistic history. As part of your diagnosis of what's wrong with the history profession and history education these days, you've coined this phrase, the anachronistic turn. And I think you've defined that here and before as this impulse to judge the past by the moral standards of the present. Usually there's some measure of iconoclasm involved. In my perspective, it seems to be getting worse. Um, You're still on campus. Are you seeing this anachronistic turn get worse? I'm not teaching. I'm at the Hoover Institution and don't have a teaching role at Stanford. I I think observing what is taught at major universities, it's reasonable, I think, for me to conclude that it's getting worse in the sense that a great many of the courses that are offered seem to be concerned with issues of identity politics that that seem very much of our time. And I'm not sure how much we really learn from going back to the 18th or 19th century and and marveling that people then were racists or or sexists. That that doesn't seem to me a particularly startling revelation. And I'm concerned that, that if one frames the history of the United States primarily in terms of first slavery and then later the civil rights movement, if that's the dominant narrative of of modern American historiography, which it would appear to be, then one's one's missing a lot that's certainly as important. There are, as I pointed out in a lecture a couple of years ago, startlingly few courses in major universities on the history of the American Revolution, the making of the constitution. There are very few courses from what I can see in the samples that I've studied on the American Civil War these days. We, I think, are in danger of reducing the history of the United States to a a story of race relations. And I think that's that's a mistake because you you really quickly lose sight of the distinctive an innovative character of the United States politically, economically, and in a whole bunch of other respects, if, if that's the thing that you, you focus on. This isn't to dismiss it. It's just to say that it's in increasingly the only thing that people are studying in high school, too. It was my experience as well. I think you lose students. You lose enrollment as well. When I was teaching courses, a lot of my colleagues um, in the history department, we were designing our own course, Sources and Methods Seminars for Upperclassmen. And it was very common for a lot of these courses um, that were teaching identity history to have enrollments of one or two. Right. And there are so many resources going into structuring those courses, preparing us pedagogically. Um, and to only have one or two students, I think, is symptomatic of just a lack of interest. I feel like that's one of the things consistent in your work that has made it valuable for me. This focus on institutional history seems to help me understand what what facilitates modern prosperity, its infrastructure, its machinery, how it's executed, and also how, you know, what might be causing prosperity to decline somewhat. So, for example, one of the books that you're known for at this point, published in 2011, was called Civilization, the West and the Rest. And you defined six particularly important institutions that were 
originated in the West. You've called them six killer apps because like apps we're familiar with on our smartphones and computers, they're open source. Anybody can download them. Um, And these were competition, science, the rule of law, medicine, the consumer society, and the work ethic. I think that list is right on. Have you received convincing pushback on any or all of these since you developed the list, or have you rethought this list of six killer apps? I've certainly received some pushback. I'm not sure how convincing any of it has been. I don't feel seven or so years later that I missed some vital uh, killer app or that one of them was superfluous. A lot of people who've who've read the book have have come up to me and said, ah, but what about democracy or, or what about Christianity? And the observation I make is that democracy arrives far too late on the scene to explain Western ascendancy, which really can be traced back to the 1600s, if not further. And uh, and Christianity has been around too long to explain it because, you know, Western Europe was, was Christian uh, from the Roman period and through the so-called Dark Ages. And you can't therefore explain Western ascendancy with reference to, to Christianity. Maybe, maybe you could explain it with reference to, to Protestantism, but I tried to show in the book that it's not really, it's not really Protestantism so much as the, the behaviors associated with it, the work ethic, literacy, a bunch of other things that really, that really mattered. Western ascendancy is one of these things that, one of these phrases that some people dislike, but, but it's an undeniable reality that beginning somewhere in the 1600s, perhaps earlier, perhaps later, people in Western Europe and in the places where West Europeans settled got a whole lot richer and healthier, longer lived and more powerful than everybody else. And this continued uh, more or less uninterruptedly right down until the late 20th century. And explaining that great divergence is, is a huge challenge. It's one of the most interesting questions in, I think, modern history. Of course, there are all kinds of contending theories about this, some which, some of which are about geography or environment or some other natural endowment. I don't find those convincing because they don't explain the timing. I mean, if, if it were all about geography or something of that sort, then really it would have been a story dating back well before the 1600s. And then the arguments that, that people have traditionally made on the left – which emphasize empire, those arguments don't work because everybody did empire. The Europeans were quite late to the empire game. There are imperial structures all over the world in, in the 1500s. Uh, it's hard to believe that, uh, that it was empire that really caused the great divergence. And as you implied in your question, Brad, in the end, it comes down to ideas and institutions. Here, the, the role of, of race is interesting because 100 or more years ago, there might have been quite a lot of people who would have said, well, the reason for Western ascendancy was the superiority of, of white people over everybody else. And I'd shown in the book that, that that idea, which certainly had a great many followers in the late 19th and early 20th century, can't, can't possibly be, be right. And, of course, the recent past shows that because it turns out that if you download the killer applications, the six killer apps, the ideas and institutions that worked for people in the West, they work for everybody. They certainly have worked quite well for people in, in East Asia since the 1980s. So the book argued that you, you got to turn to ideas and institutions to explain the great divergence. And the reason that the argument is plausible is that when you look at, let's take two, two controlled experiments that we ran, Germany and, and Korea, if you divide those countries and you give one half one set of institutions and the other half another, that very quickly they diverge. That was that was one of the most striking features of, of the division of Germany and, and Korea. And so I, I tend to take the view that institutions matter a lot and the ideas that lead to institutions being formed matter a lot in history. And that's that's really what we should be studying. Understanding why institutions work, why some work better than others, why the institutions of say, the English common law was so effective in encouraging capital formation, it's difficult. You have to kind of study the law and how it works. That's what I think historians need to do more of. And yeah, less identity politics, because in the end, one big lesson of history is that race isn't important. It certainly doesn't explain the great divergence very well. Indeed. And it's in my opinion, tragic that you can make it through education and history at a modern university without confronting 
any of these six killer apps. I mean, you really can. You can navigate your way to a major in history without coming to terms with these fundamental institutions of modern civilization. I consider these killer apps as something even more fundamental than just institutions. Maybe they're akin to modern values. I'm not so sure about that word per se, but maybe they should be viewed like more like modern values because without them, it's as you say, it's hard to see how anything else we value could be possible. And it's not specific to the West. It's specific to any society that adopts these institutions and these idea structures and these ways of organizing society. You wrote this book in 2011, and since then, identity politics has just erupted. If you were to try to sell this book, Civilization, the West, and the Rest, today, my guess is a lot of people would reject it just from the title. Um, because, as you say, that term is is considered very problematic by many people. I think that is why these six killer apps, as you've, de- as you've described them, can be so enlightening for students, um, especially who are concerned about these issues. Anybody can download them. They are, as you say, open source. That's right. I wrote a book not long after that, The Great Degeneration, observing that institutions can deteriorate and that we see that happening in many Western countries, including the United States in our time. I think that was an important corollary of the original book, Civilization, observing the ways in which institutional deterioration is, is, is happening helps us see just how important good institutions are. In economics, I think this is quite a well-established view. It was central to the work of, of Douglas North, for example. But there are a bunch of, of other scholars more recently in, in the case of uh, James Robinson and Darren Asimoglu who who've, have made this kind of argument. I think it's odd that an argument that is quite widely accepted in economics and political science is not properly appreciated in, in history. But, but that's, that's, I think, a consequence of the strange direction that academic history has taken, uh, unfortunately, because it means that students, as you, as you say, of history at universities are not really getting exposed to important issues. For example, what institutions are required for a market economy to function? Why did central planning not work when it was tried in socialist and communist regimes in the 20th century? Why did representative government succeed in some parts of the world and not in others? These are all questions about institutions, and they seem largely absent from the kind of courses that one can study at at major universities today. Our population as well seems absent in the political discourse um, in the country. Many of us understand there's something going uh, suboptimally, shall we say, with the United States, with Europe, with the West in general. We see the rise of China. And we worry about the future of, Amer- of the American economy, for example. We have a surge of populism. We have a slogan like Make America Great Again that's synonymous practically with racism in half the country's mind. So the w- way you frame the problem of decline in the great degeneration I think is more important than ever. Most of the time when people think about decline, they think about the symptoms. They think about low growth. Uh, higher unemployment, failure of fiscal monetary stimulus, the growth of the debt. These are all symptoms. In your book, you identify some of the underlying causes. You've talked about the breach of contract between generations, for example, or the rule of law being replaced by the rule of lawyers. And these all seem like erosions of the institutional foundation of everything else we value. And it seems like these things are getting worse. Do you think one or another of them is particularly bad and needs a particularly good dose of attention. I'll take the first, actually. The, the, the first chapter of The Great Degeneration argues that there's been a fundamental breakdown of the contract between the generations, something that, that Edmund Burke wrote about in his reflections on the revolution in France. Burke, who was really criticizing Rousseau's idea of a social contract, argued that the real social contract was between the, the dead, the, the living and the unborn and that there needed to be a clear relationship between the living and not only their predecessors, but also their posterity. If one looks at public finance in the United States, it is a massive breach of that contract, because in effect, 
we have massive unfunded liabilities as well as an ever larger national debt, funding a system of transfers that overwhelmingly go to uh, older Americans. And younger Americans are in a really quite unhappy predicament because on present trajectories, their lifetime taxes are likely to be substantially higher than the, the baby boomers. Uh, and probably the lifetime entitlement receipts that they get will be less. And I haven't even mentioned the, the private sector problem of student debt and other liabilities on, on young people's balance sheets. So I think the problem that I talked about in The Great Degeneration has only got worse since I wrote the book, and nothing, nothing has been done to address it. In fact, the situation in federal government finances has only got worse under President Trump. It's one of the great failures, actually, of the first two years of, of the administration. The Republicans, having campaigned on fiscal responsibility, did exactly the opposite once they got power in Congress. So I think that issue is very important because in the coming years, American politics is going to be shaped more and more by generational conflict than by any other kind of conflict, including, for that matter, racial conflict. There is a widening chasm between the young and the old in this country, politically, culturally, but I think also in terms of economic interests. And if you ask the question, gee, why are younger voters in the millennials or, or Generation Z attracted, Generation Z attracted to socialism, I'll tell you why. Number one, they have been taught nothing about the history of socialism, and they have no idea what happened when socialism was tried in the 20th century. And number two, they've been put in a position by generational imbalances in which it's in their interests to be attracted by expropriation or very large scale taxation of the rich and student debt cancellation, free education. This is not an unsurprising set of desires for that generation, given their predicament. I'd like to zero in now on your most recent book, The Square and the Tower. I watched a recording of your talk at the Long Now Foundation last November, and someone in the audience laughed when you said that what's going on now with social network disruption and the rise of populism that we've been talking about is an echo of what happened after the introduction of the printing press 500 years ago. And I just thought, I mean, how perfectly to your point was that? In the book, you point out that the tech community laughs at the notion that history can teach them anything about network disruption and that this is all brand new, this is unprecedented, the permutation of platforms like Twitter, Facebook, and other social networks is wholly unprecedented. But there are disturbing similarities between what happened then and what is already emerging now. Correct. And I was very happy when that gentleman laughed because it gave me an opportunity to, to make a little fun of him and, and observe that if you don't think historically, you will not understand our, our contemporary predicament. Most people flail around with 20th century analogies when they're trying to understand the situation today, whether it's the 1930s or the 1970s. And these are all quite unhelpful because what happened with the advent of the personal computer and the internet has no real analog in the 20th century 19th, 18th, or for that matter, even the late 17th century, you have to go right back to the early 1500s to see a comparable disruption of the public sphere by a new technology. And my argument in the book is that the printing press played a similar role in Europe to the personal computer and the internet in the world in our time. It drastically reduced the cost of communication, and it exponentially increased the volume of content that could be distributed. It made social networks larger and, and faster working than had been possible before. And that had consequences of which the most obvious was the crisis of Western Christendom that resulted in the Reformation. What's fascinating about this analogy is how well it works when you're trying to understand the pathologies of our time. Back then, Martin Luther and other reformers thought that they were going to have a tremendously positive effect by spreading the printed uh, version of the Bible and encouraging people to have their own direct relationship to God. But, but the unintended consequences of this were really quite surprising and, and alarming. Instead of the priesthood of all believers, you ended up with a deeply divided Europe. Some people agreeing with Luther and the other reformers and some people violently disagreeing. Polarization, conflict. And what we would now call fake news, it turned out that you could transmit through the network not only Luther's call for reform, but you could also 
transmit crazy ideas like witches live amongst us and should be burnt at the stake. And the witch craze of the 16th and 17th century is a wonderful example of of what happens when you build a new network that shares information really rapidly and it actually shares fake news more rapidly and spreads it further than than it does truth. So I, I found as I read more deeply into the history of the printing press and the consequences of the Reformation that it seemed eerily familiar. This seemed like all the pathologies of social networks in our own time occurring in a different time in a very different context, but with similar qualities. I can't see a better analogy if we're trying to understand why we've experienced so much polarization, why fake news circulates so rapidly. It seems to me of all the analogies that one could try, the best one. Uh, And yeah, you actually can understand the early 21st century better if you understand the 16th and 17th century. That, That should not be a cause for laughter the real laughter should be by historians at those people who who are ignorant of the past. Ignorance also, perhaps, of network science. Um, one of the most powerful parts of the Square and the Tower is this fusion between uh, network science analysis and your historical analysis. And that really helps to bring, it makes many of the events we're seeing today predictable, almost, this fake news and extreme views propagation on these networks, just as readily as truth and knowledge Uh, revolutionary knowledge in many cases. Obviously, there are benefits to both networks, um, the printing press enabling literary networks and uh, social media enabling these, these digital networks. They have clear benefits. How do you balance the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment with the Reformation, with the Malleus Maleficarum, Uh, with that kind of tribalism? And how should we think about balancing the benefits and the consequences today? Have you come down on one side or the other? Well, the square in the tower argues that just as the new network of printing propagated the Reformation and unleashed about 130 years of religious conflict, just as it propagated crazy ideas about witchcraft that led to the deaths of thousands of innocent women, mostly women, It also made possible the scientific revolution and later the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution. And indeed, over time, those transformations in in thought overcame ideas about witchcraft, though they didn't initially overcome Protestantism. Keith Thomas wrote a great book, Religion and the Decline of Magic, back when I was an undergraduate, showing how ideas about witchcraft were gradually driven out in the later part of the 17th century and in the 18th century because scientific ideas and and then enlightenment ideas came to dominate. And I think that that transformation is a really important part of the story of modernity. In the book, I tried to show why it was that these alternate strains of thought were able to spread. The network of the scientific revolution or for that matter, the Enlightenment was an elite network with relatively few members. They did exchange printed matter, but they also corresponded using pen and ink. And it's striking that when one graphs these networks, they are relatively small in scale, though quite far reaching in in geography. The critical point, of course, is what happened when ideas about the political system spread from the the realm of the intellectuals into the realm of action. And the two revolutions, the American and the French, took completely different paths, even although they were broadly drawing on the same body of ideas about democracy and liberty and and equality. And I reflect in the book on, on these very different outcomes and why it was that in the case of France, the revolution descended into anarchy and and extreme bloodshed. And and finally, the whole vision of a network to democracy gave way and Napoleonic rule took its place, hierarchy was reimposed. So I, I think there's a kind of narrative there in which the network technologically uh, based network is kind of value neutral, it can transmit good and bad ideas. And there's no guarantee that the good will drive out the bad. That that did happen, certainly in North America. Uh, but I don't think you could make the same claim about France. Well, Neil, I'm mindful of your time. But before I let you go, I have to ask, what makes you optimistic? 
because much of your writing in recent years has shown us that we are being stewarded in certain ways down some very dystopian roads. So despite all this nonsense we indulge in and all of the tribalism we see resurgent, what are our strengths these days? What, what is the power of our generation? Well, I think there is a good deal to be pessimistic about. And I think historians, if they've done their homework, are probably rather inclined to, to pessimism. I have an ongoing argument with my old friend Steve Pinker about the meaning of of modernity. Steve is an optimist who sees the trend lines as being our friends in a world that gets steadily better. That's the message of his most recent book, Enlightenment Now. And and my argument is, well, you could have said that and written that 100 years ago or 110 years ago, and then World War I and World War II would have come along and made a nonsense of your optimism. The, there are two big points I'd make. Number one, and this is an argument I made in a book called The War of the World back in 2006, the potential for large-scale, organized, lethal conflict still exists. And the 20th century reminds us that it is perfectly possible for highly advanced societies to engage in that kind of behavior. We've never had more destructive weaponry than we have today. And we are constantly devising new ways in which to wage war, including, of course, cyber warfare. So one has to be a little nervous about the prospect of perpetual peace. That seems a rather unlikely future scenario. The second point I'd make is that the great degeneration just keeps on going in Western democracies. And it's not quite clear to me how we extricate ourselves from these processes of institutional degeneration. Indeed, since I wrote the book, new threats to the fabric of society have manifested themselves. Just think of the opioid epidemic, which back when I was writing The Great Degeneration, no one really was aware of. If if there's anything to be optimistic about, I think it is that a relatively decentralized system, and I think the United States is still relatively decentralized compared with, say, China, probably stands a better chance of succeeding in the long term than a highly centralized hierarchical system. That that seems like an obvious 20th century lesson. And if we can retain decentralization in our system, then the probability is that, that good ideas will percolate from some part of the network and have a chance of making it. That's just much less likely in a very centralized system. So if the next 10 or 20 or 30 years is going to be a contest between the United States and China, then I'd be inclined to think that for all its flaws, the the decentralized federal democratic United States will in fact do better than the highly centralized and increasingly totalitarian People's Republic of China. That, That seems like a very important lesson of history. And if you're looking, Brad, for an optimistic note on which to end, that's the one I, I offer you. But if we don't preserve our decentralization, if we don't retain a kind of blockchain quality, if we end up just being a giant network platform dominated by Facebook and Google, I'm not sure that we'll be that much better than, than the Chinese. It'll just be that our surveillance state is privatized and theirs is, is government owned. The choice in the end is up to us. The biggest and most important lesson of history is that there is a lot of of human agency, of free will, of individual liberty. And the question is really, do you exercise that or do you passively accept that trend towards centralization that Tocqueville identified way, way back in the early 19th century as the biggest enemy of democracy and above all of, of liberty? Well, Neil, this has been an amazingly interesting conversation And uh, I encourage everybody to check out all of Neil Ferguson's work, especially his latest book, The Square and the Tower. Uh, Neil, do you want to shout out any of your other work or landing pages online? The the lesson of of history is always talk about your most recent book. So I will merely endorse your endorsement of The Square and the Tower. Anybody who wants to hear more from me or read more by me can go to my website, neilferguson.com, where there's quite a lot of my journalism from recent years. And I think there's a rather alarming amount of video content on on YouTube making money for Google rather than for me, but it's there. 
and it may be of interest. We'll see how they censor that. Neil Ferguson, thank you again. Thank you, Brad. 